Use this? Okay. All right. Hello and good evening, everyone. I'm LaShawn Ford, a resident of Austin and state representative. Thank you all for coming. And most importantly, we want to thank um, Cook County Clerk Karen Yarbrough and her entire staff. Um, and the librarian here for hosting us. So why don't we um, allow the um, Karen Yarbrough uh, staff to introduce themselves and um, just by name so you know who they are and um, they're gonna always be here to serve you even after today. And so we'll start right here. Good evening, my name is Lindsay Chase. And I am the Executive Assistant of Community Affairs for Cook County Clerk Karen A. office. Thank you. And the boss of C.B. Johnson, but go ahead. <laughs> My name is Wendy Johnson. I work in administration, and I'm an Executive Assistant to the clerk. Thank you. Brian Cross, Director of Veterans Services. Thank you. And my name is Jim Gleffie. I'm the Deputy Chief of Staff and Labor Counsel for the Cook County Clerk Karen A. And, of course, the clerk is at a, a dedication at Chicago State. I don't know if I should tell that, but she wanted to be here, but there's so much going on, and um, but she brought a full team, and there's a big thing going on at Chicago State where they're doing a dedication at the university, and they wanted um, the clerk to be on the panel to speak. So she's um, going to be there speaking at that on that panel. So today, um, the clerk and I served together in Springfield, and one of the passions that she had was real estate and making sure that people were able to keep their houses and make sure that people were not defrauded in any situation. So now she's at a big um, role where she can help people. And so today we're going to learn how to transfer your home, your car, and your bank accounts to your loved ones. If so happen, you die. I don't know who's dying in this room, but I'm almost sure, as my mother would tell me, you are for sure to get your number called one day. So we're going to have speakers with um, licensed professionals here today to protect you and your homes from property fraud. And so thank you for coming out. And everyone here is from the Austin community or surrounding areas. If you're not from Austin, raise your hand. So thank you very much. I think we have the room of people and we also have people on Zoom. So thank you for coming out. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Oh, who's over here? Uh-oh, I gotta do it again. <laughs> oh, uh, who, who are the people over here? We, do we have legal aid Chicago? They're like, what are we, chopped liver? <laughs> so let's go right here to my right. Uh, that's not chopped liver. Who's to my far right? And? My name is Barbara Servant. I'm the Associate Director of Community Partnerships at Legal Aid Chicago. Thank you so very much. Thank you. Uh -huh. Good evening, everyone. Once again, my name is Lindsay Chase, and I'm the Executive Assistant for Community Affairs at Cook County Clerk Karen A. Yarbrough's office. I first want to start off by saying thank you so very much to State Rep LaShawn Ford and his chief of staff, Dr. Stephanie Rose Spaulding. They both have been wonderful and very, very helpful. So we want to thank them. <laughs> Next, I want to say thank you to all the Cook County Clerk's staff, and I want to give another quick introduction of everybody that's here. So to my left, we have chief of staff and labor counsel, Jim Gleffie. Hello. In the back, working all of our great technology and from communications, we have Carlos Rodriguez. <laughs> Next to him, we have Director of Veteran Services, Mr. Brian Cross. Next to him, we have over in administration, Ms. Wendy Johnson. And we want, I, we want to thank them for helping and volunteering with us. So. First, we're just going to go over some quick um, housekeeping items. Out of the doors to your right are the restrooms, if you need to use the restrooms. If everyone can silence their cell phones for the presentation so we can be putting all of our attention towards the presentation. When you all came in and registered or signed in today, you should have had your um, been presented with a note card, one or two. So that way you could write down your questions 
for legal counsel and they can answer the questions. If you didn't get a card, could you raise your hand? Mr. Cross, could you bring her a card, please, for me? Thank you. We hope that you will find the information that you get today useful. Has anybody seen the presentation before or been to a property after death forum? Wonderful. Have you been using the information that you've gotten? I actually have. Oh, we're so glad to hear it. Have you been sharing it with neighbors and friends? Oh, we love that. See, so right here, Ms. Barbara is doing exactly what we hope you all will do. Use and share the information that you're getting to your neighbors and your community, friends and family, even if they aren't your neighbors. Um, on behalf of Clerk Yarbrough, we want to thank our community partners for partnering with us and helping you all get this information. Um, last but not least, if you can silence your cell phones and then we will have the presentation. Hello and welcome. I'm Karen Yarbrough, your Cook County Clerk. Thank you for joining us for this presentation on property fraud and managing your property after death. The Cook County Clerk's Office is one of the largest consolidated clerk's offices in the entire nation. In addition to functioning as the chief election authority for suburban Cook County, we maintain birth, marriage, and death records, and we assist property owners in redeeming delinquent taxes. We also have a recording operations division that records and stores land records and other official documents, which includes deeds, transfer on death instruments, and real estate documents. Now, nobody wants to talk about death or end of life planning but it's a critical issue when it comes to managing your assets to protect your family and your loved ones. And we all need to be aware of the threat of property fraud and how we can guard against this type of financial crime. At the Cook County Clerk's Office, we are here to serve. And we hope that this information you received today will be helpful on these important issues that impact all of our daily lives. Now, I'd like to introduce you to my trusty assistant who will guide us through this presentation. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Before we begin our discussion, we want to let you know that we will have volunteer attorneys available at the end of the presentation who can answer your questions about the topics we will be covering. If you are joining our program via Zoom, and have questions that come up during the presentation, simply type your question in the Q&A section through your Zoom link and the attorneys will respond accordingly. Now let's begin our discussion by talking about property fraud, which can also be known as deed fraud. So what exactly is property fraud? Property fraud is the fraudulent and illegal recording of a document against your home's property records. We call it paper terrorism and it is a very real problem and potential risk for all property owners. How can this happen? Almost every state has an open and public recording system, meaning that you cannot freeze your chain of title like you can your credit report. Plus county recorders are not authorized by law to validate legal claims made in documents. Property fraud can involve the recording or filing of false or forged transfers of ownership quick claim deeds, or the filing of a bogus lien to steal property or harass an unsuspecting property owner. Even if your home is paid off, that does not stop someone from filing a new deed on top of it without the property owner's knowledge. Let's look at this NBC5 investigative report that takes a close look at how property fraud can occur. By law, it is a line anyone can stand in and a fee anyone can pay. 
$40 is all it takes to get a deed or other document officially recorded in Cook County, a simple perk of open government openly abused by serious scammers. I think they call them, you know, financial parasites. She was new to her office as recorder of deeds when Karen Yarborough says she first spotted the trouble. To steal a home, all you have to do is doctor some paperwork up and Photoshop it, bring it to the recorder's office, record it, voila, you own a home. Con artists exploiting a system that relies on the honesty of those who use it, recording forged documents in order to steal a home outright. Sound far-fetched? This is a kind of crime that I never imagined that could happen. It did to Chicago treasurer Stephanie Neely until it happened to her. I get this call, I'm like, what do you mean someone has taken, changed the name on my deed? What, what do you mean? How do they do that? In her case, a stranger recorded a fraudulent deed, waited until she was at work, and then changed the lock. They want to physically be in your house. Because once they're there, it's very difficult to get them out. Precisely what happened to this Chicago woman. This individual had paperwork that uh, was Xerox that showed the deed was in his name. She asked us to conceal her identity because... You're in constant fear that they will try something next because, believe it or not, they did come back three days later. One man connected to her case was arrested and convicted. As the recorder's office continued to field fake documents. I decided that I couldn't sit idly by and watch this happen. Yarborough brought in this man. They believe that the government created artificial duplicates of all of us. An expert on sovereign citizens, the extreme anti-government movement often behind this crime. They believe they can completely ignore our government and do whatever they want to do with impunity. Pete Cavage calls it paper terrorism and teaches the red flags, like the punctuation sovereigns add in the middle of names, the refusal to use mainstream addresses or zip codes, and how they employ lengthy, arcane terms. The flurry of documents they file may be fake, but their threat is real. They're bullies. They're brazen. They think that nothing can touch them. A lot of times they'll come in and overwhelm our frontline staff. You know, it may be 20 of them will come in. Yarborough has a catchy comparison she uses to get a non-believer's attention. In Illinois, it is easier to steal a home than it is to steal a car. It's fraud and, you know, they're taking people's homes. So there is now a simple way for some homeowners to protect themselves, the free property fraud alert system. You load your property index number, then you get an alert if any document is recorded in connection with your property. Counties across the country are now turning to this kind of system as these cases of mortgage and property fraud continue to grow. Lisa Parker, NBC5, investigates. To combat this problem, Clark Yarbrough created a property fraud unit with investigators and caseworkers who respond to and investigate any complaints of property fraud. The clerk's office also offers a free property fraud alert that will provide a telephone call or email to the property owner anytime a document is recorded against their property or the property of a loved one. There are three easy ways to sign up for the clerk's free property fraud alert. You may sign up in person at the clerk's office, sign up online, sign up with a telephone call. Once registered, if you receive an alert or have reason to be concerned about property fraud, you can contact the clerk's property fraud unit and our staff can help research the problem and coordinate a response. Call 312-603-4000 or visit our website at www.cookcountyclerk.com slash property fraud. On a related note, while we're on the topic of your chain of title and fraud, property owners often need to obtain an official copy of their property deed when purchasing a home or for tax purposes. You should be aware there is a predatory practice aimed at homeowners in which companies offer a copy of your property's deed at a large markup price, sometimes exceeding $200. The clerk's office wants to remind you that we offer the same service starting at just $6. So there is no reason to pay exorbitant prices to gain access to these essential documents. Now let's move on to the second part of our program, which is making plans to manage your property and assets in the event of your death. 
As Clark Yarbrough noted, no one wants to talk about death or end of life planning, but it is critical to manage your assets to protect your family and loved ones. Having a sound end of life plan is one of the greatest gifts that you can provide to your children and family members. Consider this, what do you think of these three legendary individuals have in common? Prince, Aretha Franklin, four score and seven years ago, our father, and Abraham Lincoln. Actually, they have something very unfortunate in common. They failed to make plans for their assets upon their death. No will, no trust, no plan. Now let's consider someone who thought he had it right. Music legend James Brown, the godfather of soul. When he passed away in 2006, Brown's estate was worth an estimated $90 million. When he died, Brown left behind a plan for most of his estate to pay for scholarships for children in need in South Carolina, the state where he was born. But that will was challenged by family members after his death, resulting in more than 12 lawsuits. It took more than a decade of litigation before Mr. Brown's assets were designated as he had intended. So how do you get it right when it comes to your property after death? The best advice is to consult an attorney or an estate planning professional to provide you with advice for your specific circumstances. But you should also know that under Illinois law, you can transfer your home, your car, or your bank account to a loved one without a will or trust, and without having to pay fees or court costs. Here are the details on how to transfer your property. First, the transfer on death instrument. The clerk's office offers a free document on our website known as a transfer on death instrument or a TODI. You can also obtain this document at no cost from an attorney or legal aid organization. The form should be completed and notarized and then recorded at the clerk's office in our Recording Operations Division. The transfer on death instrument will then be recorded on your property's chain of title. And upon your death, the person designated to receive your property can do so after completing the required forms. Please note that the clerk's office cannot assist you in the preparation of the transfer on death instrument or any legal document, and we do not provide legal advice to customers. Next, let's discuss a payable on death instrument. You can transfer the funds from your bank account in a similar way, utilizing a tool known as a payable on death instrument. A person can transfer assets in a bank account to a beneficiary of their choosing after death. A payable on death instrument can be obtained and used at most financial institutions for checking and savings accounts, certificates of deposits, CDs, money markets, and savings bonds. Even if you have completed a payable on death instrument, the account holder has full control of their funds in the account until the time of their death. When the account holder passes, the beneficiary can claim specified assets directly from the financial institution without having to wait for probate court proceedings. Finally, let's discuss a beneficiary affidavit. And lastly, there is also a mechanism to transfer your car to a designated beneficiary. A vehicle owner may change, add, or remove a beneficiary on the title of their car by completing a free beneficiary affidavit through the Illinois Secretary of State's office. To obtain this beneficiary affidavit, go to the Illinois Secretary of State website at www.ilsos.gov. Keep in mind that if money is still owed on your home or vehicle at the time of your death, your beneficiary will still be responsible for the mortgage and payments moving forward. On behalf of Clerk Karen Yarbrough, we hope that you have found this presentation useful. The clerk's office is your first line of defense against property fraud, so we hope that you will take this opportunity to sign up for our free property fraud alert if you have not already done so. Managing your property and your assets in the event of your death is also critical to protect your family and your assets. 
and to ensure that your wishes are carried out after your death. A copy of this presentation is available on the clerk's website if you would like to review it again or share with a friend or family member. Go to www.cookcountyclerk.com slash PAD resources to view the presentation. Now let's ask the volunteer attorneys who are joining us to introduce themselves and we will open up our presentation for your questions. So did everyone enjoy the presentation? Was it good? Did you learn something that you didn't know before you got here? Okay, so I already introduced attorney uh, Mr. Jim Gleffey. I'm going to introduce the rest of the attorneys. In the back, we have Devin Mates. <laughs> and online, we have Kang Tran. He's online. And our partnering attorneys that you have sitting right here to my left is attorney Ted London. And online, our other partnering attorney is attorney Stephen Hinton. I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Gleffey to take over. Hi, good evening, everybody. I'm Jim Gleffey. Once again, I'm the Deputy Chief of Staff and Labor Counsel for the Cook County Clerk's Office. I'd like to thank everyone for coming today. I'd like to thank Mr. London for being in attendance. I am actually an attorney for the Clerk's Office. I cannot provide legal advice for you. I'm here to provide information to you to answer some of your questions. Luckily, Mr. London is not an employee of our office, and he is a, a practicing attorney who can provide advice to you. Um, he'll be happy to answer some questions and talk with you after the presentation is complete and uh, tell you a little bit more about th th Those are situations where you get a little bit more in the weeds and your personal situations and, and maybe set up a time with Mr. London to meet um, about your individual situations. But um, we also have the folks from Legal Aid today. I know that we've, they've already been introduced. And so uh, with that said, um, I know that everyone was given an index card uh, to put their questions uh, for us out. So is maybe Brian or Lindsay, can you start collecting the cards Absolutely. and bringing them up front? And for those people that are on the Zoom call, you don't have index cards, obviously. If you have questions, our online attorneys could help you answer those questions by, um, it, what you have to do is basically put your question in the chat on the Zoom, and they'll be happy to answer your questions online. So. Anybody else like another index card? I have any extras to anybody who would like one? Thank you. And you can, as, as the questions are being collected, you could feel free to um, to hand them over to us. Anybody else have a question? Index card? Can I ask a question? Please write it down. Index card? You ask it, you read them, and then I'll okay. go back. Sounds good. So the first question we have here today is how long does a toady last? Basically, I'm guessing the question is once you record the toady, how how long is it in effect? That was me. I didn't mean to say toady. I meant to say the fraud alert. Oh, <laughs> the fraud alert. So the property fraud alert will stay on the property until you take it off. Okay. Thank you. Obviously, if there's a transfer of the property, you know, at that point, then the new homeowner can put their own fraud alert on there, but um, it stays on until you decide you don't want it on. Okay. Thank you. Okay. The second question we have is, is the property still registered for fraud alert? 312, that's the number for our fraud unit, I will say. Uh, whoever put it on the index card has our number. Yeah. It's 312. No, I, just the, I just put the number down. That was me. Okay. Question. Um, it's related to her question, too. Um, I did this, oh, it's, about, it's been about 10, 15 years ago, and I put in for the fraud alert, so I'm just, that's my question. Is it still there? Am it I should, still registered for that? It is effective uh, until you take it off. But if you want peace of mind, the number you put on the card, feel free to call that number, 603-4000. That's area code 312-603-4000. And our fraud unit will be happy to, to look it up, make sure that the fraud uh, alert is still in place okay. for your property. Can I get my card back? Oh, sure. <laughs> okay. 
The next question is, is a probate attorney needed to purchase a parent's home slash reverse mortgage? Is that's your question? Yes. So I'm guessing uh, is reverse mortgage a different question or is it part? No, the house has been reverse mortgage. Okay. Passed on a few months ago. So okay. actually, hi, I'm attorney Ted Lutton. I'll answer that question. So actually, that's a multi-layered question because you have the first issue of the reverse mortgage. And so typically when there's a reverse mortgage, there are a number of issues. The first issue is oftentimes when someone gets a reverse mortgage, after they've lived in the home for 15, 20, 25 years, they haven't paid any of the expenses. What we see is more times than not, more is owed on the home than the home is worth. So you have to first determine, is it worth even redeeming the home? So if there's a reverse mortgage and you determine that it is worth redeeming the home, then you have to go through the probate process to get the home in, in, one, in the heir's name. And so oftentimes if someone's living in the home, one of the children, they think that they're entitled to the home exclusively, but they are not. And so if there are four or five or eight or 13 children, legally they are all entitled to the home. And so that's why it's so important to make sure that you have some estate planning totally, land trust, living trust, uh, so you can mitigate some of the family members being entitled to the home. So if there's a reverse mortgage, you have to first determine if it's worth redeeming the home. You know, if there's a reverse mortgage, typically the reverse mortgage company gives the family members one year to redeem the home. And so you have to pay that money off. You're not going to have to buy the home. You're going to have to refinance it, but there has to be enough equity in the home to make it worthwhile. Okay. Let me, I mean, if I say something else to that question too, you know what, my office used to do review a lot of contracts for reverse mortgages. And what we find is typically nine out of 10 families who come in with a contract to do a reverse mortgage, once we go through the, the application and we see what the cost the expenses and what they're giving up, nine out of 10 times they don't get it. Okay, and then we get a lot of calls from people who are trying to get out of reverse reverse mortgage, and so again, sometimes more is older on the property than it's worth, and then they can't actually get out of it. So think carefully before getting a reverse mortgage. Yeah, just as a personal story of mine, my grandmother owned a two flat in the southwest side of the city. She had a reverse mortgage to help supplement her retirement income. She was getting a check every month, but then when she passed. Um, the reverse mortgage became due and we had to pay the mortgage and the siblings were fighting they couldn't agree on what to do and unfortunately the property ended up going into foreclosure and we lost the property so just reverse mortgages do complicate I'm not advocating for them or against them but just it's, it's something to consider when a homeowner goes through and gets a reverse mortgage on their property what can I ask you a question sure were those fees and the interest accrued, or could they ask more than what the house is worth? I'm told by real estate attorneys they can't ask for more than what the house is worth. I can answer that question. The fact is they can ask for more than the home is worth. They can ask is what... Is illegal? Yes. They can ask for what the balance is. And oftentimes the reverse mortgage company will give maybe up to a 10% discount. You know, I just did a radio show today. I do a radio show on WVON. And today the topic was reverse mortgage insurance. So actually the reverse mortgage company has an insurance that you can get when you get the reverse mortgage that will pay the overage. And so, but you have to get that at the time of, of getting the reverse mortgage. <laughs> Yes. Um, my my uh, husband and his sister owned a home together, and they both had passed away. And the uh, sister part went to her kid, and we paid two of them off. And one of them is still living in a home. She hasn't paid anything. Can she just stay there without paying? So, so if, if I may ask, so the question is, two people own a home, brother and sister. Mm -hmm. So the, typically the first question I would ask is, do they own it in joint tenancy? Yes. And so if they own a joint tenancy, then when one of the siblings pass away, the one survives owns the entirety of it, period. Well, I need to ask you something else about that after, after this. Well, so I, Matt, Matt, you still want me to answer your question? Yes. Got it. So if brothers and sisters own a home together mm -hmm. in joint tenancy, mm -hmm. if one of them pass away, then the survivor owns the entirety of the home. They don't have to give the other siblings' children any portion of it. They own it completely. 
what, what, okay, what happened was, now I didn't know that. And we've been, we, we've been in court all these years trying to get her out. And the lawyer never told us that. Well, I'm sorry, here's what I'm telling you. So again, what you, if they own it in joint tenancy, there's two ways to own a property if you own it with multiple people. You can own it in joint tenancy. That means if multiple people own the property, if one of them passes away, it's, it crashes into the survivor. So their share goes into all the others. It, it, there's what's called tenancy in common. If multiple people own a property, then they all have their own shares, and when they pass away, their shares go to their loved ones. But it has to be probated. <coughs> so, so you could potentially have three people that own a property in tenancy in common, and when each of them pass away, each of their shares have to be probated. That's a nightmare and very, very expensive. And then you have many, many owners that's going to make it even, uh, what's, the worst, what's worse than a nightmare? <laughs> a, a horror show. Okay? It's going to be a Donald Trump, okay? And so, so you know, you, you have to consult with lawyers when you are putting, when you're buying property with people because it can turn out to be a nightmare. And, and think about tenancy in common is like a, a tree. And the, say there's three people that own a tenancy in common, one, two, and three. If one passes away, two and three doesn't get the interest to one. One's heirs get the interest to one. So if one, two, and three all pass away, then one heirs owns one share, two's heirs owns two share, and three's heirs owns three share. And then the, all of their interests must be probated. Ooh. Yes. So the point is, it, talk to the attorney. I, I highly suggest joint tenancy. We've been there for four years. Pardon me, say again, ma'am. We in chancery court with the... Well, that's another issue. Chancery is another issue, so I'm not quite sure what that issue is, but that, if it's in chancery, that's not a probate issue. Right. I'm not sure what that, that issue is. Right. Yeah. Okay. I, just, I just wanted to know. I'm just, I'm just having a hard, hard time with this. Because she's not paying Um, obviously, you're free to speak with Mr. London after yeah. the presentation. I'll, I'll give, I'll get give you a little all bit flyers. More you, can all, you can always call me anytime okay. if you have more so, questions. Yes. Um, the next question I, um, that I have here, it says, I usually handle all of my mom's affairs. How do I fill this out? I'm guessing you're referring to the, the toady form. Yeah. So you received a copy of the toady form. Um, that pretty much is the form. Uh, you, you fill out the beneficiaries. You have to make sure that there's two witnesses to the, when you sign and fill out the form and have it notarized. It's important to have it notarized. You have to have two witnesses, and those two witnesses cannot be the beneficiaries under the toady because that would cause create a problem. So now you know I took that I took that question in, in, in a different perspective. I'll, I'll just wait until she ends that. Got it. So I took that question in a different perspective. So her, well, her statement was that she takes care of her mom's business. And so my first question would be, do you have the legal authority to do that? No. So that is, so you need power of attorneys, really. Yes, I know that. I was getting <laughs> Got it. And so in order to really to be filling out Tony's on behalf of someone else, you actually have to have the legal authority just because you're someone's child or even if you're someone's spouse. You don't really have the authority to do that unless you have the legal authority to do it, and that's by way of a power of attorney that a person must sign themselves, and they must be competent to do so. So, frankly, based on what you're saying, you don't have legal authority to <laughs> fill out a toady for your mom. So, because, you know, she'll read and fill out stuff on her own. Well, you can you can do you can manage her affairs for her yeah, if she I'm gives talking. you the legal authority to do so. The way that you get the legal authority to do so is have power of attorneys. Yes. There are two of them. There's one for health care, one for business matters. So you may want to look into getting power of attorneys that will give you the authorization to do that okay. for your mom. And I think one of our legal aid attorneys wanted to add something. So just you know, at Legal Aid Chicago, we can assist you with powers of attorney and toadies. So if you wanted to get your mom in touch with us, we can help her get that power of attorney set up for you. Um, as long as she is still competent to do so, we can get her set up, have you set as her power of attorney, if, if you're the one she definitely wants to do that. Um, and then we can help her start that paperwork and we can get the toady filled out 
on her behalf as well. I'm her only child. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. And that's great. Uh, so we can actually absolutely do that. Um, so we have all the information up here. So if anyone wants to come grab flyers after after the question period, but our intake line, just so you're aware, I see that you do have a pen. Our intake line is 312-341-1070. So we do the powers of attorney, we do the toadies, and we also do living wills, which is different from a will with the estate plan. A living will is for your end of life medical choices. Um, so we can absolutely help your mom with that. I know often that we think of property after death for those who are younger and and our parents. Right. But um, I just saw a news report even about like our college students. If they are 18, you do not have access to their medical records. You do not have access to their bank accounts. So even your your children right now having power of attorney or articulating or setting that up. Um, to know like what that looks like because you might say you're 18 and you're living in my house <laughs> or you know I'm paying for you to go to college but um, because of HIPAA and other, other rules so it's not always just about our parents it's, it's siblings and children and grandchildren on a personal note for my 18th birthday my mother got me a health care power of attorney um, so that she could access medical records in case anything happened. Because as has been mentioned a few times, no one wants to talk about those worst case scenarios, but those worst <coughs> case scenarios happen. And the really worst case scenario is that something terrible happens and you can't do anything to help your loved one. So get that paperwork in order if you're 18. If you've got a loved one who's 18, talk to them about it and we can help out with that. We do have income limits for people under 60, but if you're 60 or over, there is no income limit. But that phone number I gave, 312-341-1070. Just have folks call and we'll talk you through and see if you qualify for services. Uh, are you affiliated with the senior legal aid also? Is that well, from the same office? Well, we, we do have senior services at Legal right. Aid Chicago, yes. I'm saying at that same phone number. Oh, Is that yes. a different phone number for seniors? But we do have a different phone number, yes. So there is a different phone number. That's our main intake line. You can still call that number and there is a prompt on the phone tree that says if you are a senior citizen hit that number and it'll redirect you it's just easier to give the one phone number rather than okay. hey if you're a senior call this number hey if you're calling about right. your toady call this number if you're calling okay. about housing call this number right. so that one number it will absolutely say if you are a senior citizen hit this number and it'll direct you to that line yes ma'am okay. no may i add one more thing about power of attorneys um, you know what, we see uh, mostly women in the room here today, and that's not unusual when I go out to speaking engagements. We see more ladies, and the fact is you ladies are caregivers, and oftentimes you're going to be caring for spouses, parents, sometimes grandparents, and you really want to make sure that you're in a position to really do it for them, and the way that you get yourself in a position to make decisions for your loved ones. You need them for yourself as well, but again, you ladies are caregivers for multiple generations, you really want to make sure that you're in a position to manage their affairs if it comes to that. And the way that you do that is by having the power of attorneys. There are two of them. There's one for health care, one for business matters. Here's what's interesting. We have many clients married for 50, 55, 60, 65 years and longer. They are always fascinated to learn that although they've been married for 50 plus years, they cannot make decisions for one another without power of attorneys. So for either of you who have long-term marriages, you even need them for your spouses as well. Very excellent points by our, our legal partners. So thank you for your, your answers. I'd like to move on to the next question, which I believe was uh, a, a follow-up. How do I apply for a fraud alert? And so, as you may have heard during the presentation, signing up for a fraud alert is relatively easy. There's three ways you can do it. Um, you can do it online. Uh, you can find it on our website at, uh, let's see here. I have it. I just want to make sure Cook I have it. It's cookcountyclerkil.gov. Or you can do it here. You can do it today in person. We have the forms in the back. And we also can do it over the phone. And you can do it by calling our property fraud alert number, which is 312-603-4000. So does that answer your question? Okay. 
Okay, the next question. Will a mortgage company acknowledge the toady? That's a good question. Do you want to take well, that Well, so here's a, that's an interesting question, too. The, it, it's not relevant that the mortgage company acknowledges the toady because when someone passes away, if there is an outstanding mortgage on the property, you don't even have to advise them that the loved one has passed away. Because often what we see is people will call the mortgage company to try to attempt to get their names on the mortgage. That's not going to happen. You're not going to get your name on the mortgage. And frankly, the mortgage company doesn't really care that your loved one has passed away. They have only interest in one thing. What's that? Payment. Payment. So as long as you keep that mortgage current, then you're going to be fine. Now the issue is, how do you get the property in your name? And so, if there is a toady, yes, it's not relevant that the mortgage company recognize the toady because the record of deeds is going to recognize that. And so, you're going to have the home in your name, but the mortgage is still going to be a mom's name, dad's name, whosoever name the mortgage is in. And oftentimes, when clients come in for consultation with, in my office, the issue for me with respect to getting the mortgage in their name, the client's name, versus leaving it in their parent's name, a loved one's name, is, is the interest rate. If the interest rate is competitive, 3%, 3.5%, 4%, some even 2.75%, yes, you're not going to get the interest rates an hour 6%. So you might as well just leave it in your parents' names. Once the mortgage is paid off, they will send what's called a satisfaction of mortgage to the record of these offices to show that there is no mortgage owed on the property, and there will be no money owed on it, and the property will be in your name. It will be a good deal for you. Mm -hmm. But you do have to make sure that you do some sort of estate planning to make sure that the house is not going to have to go through the expensive, time-consuming, stressful probate process. So many people procrastinate, and they don't get it done, and they have well-intentioned, but they don't. And then when they go to heaven, their families are caught in a, in a jam, especially if there are a lot of children and if the children aren't getting along, getting along well. That really puts the property in risk of being lost. I, I kind of got a question that might kind of, you know, <laughs> like me. I have five siblings. My mom just passed away in April. Nobody's name's on the lit, on the D. Mm -hmm. And I guess that's my question. Do we really have to get everybody's name on the D? I'm the only one working. You don't, have, you don't have to go any further. Just, Let me answer the question. So your situation is, is very common. So her question is, is six kids, mom passed away, she didn't have any estate plan, she's the only one working. That's very common. Here's the bad news. It's always the bad kid that lives in the house, yep. typically. <laughs> and, and, they, and they are dominating the space in the home, playing the loudest music, smoking the most weed, uh, living in the basement, first floor, second floor, and they don't have any money. And it's always one of the good kids who wants to save the home because the home has been in the family 30 years, 30 plus years, and you, and you have a connection to the home and your mom and dad's hard work to acquire the home so you don't want to lose it. But yes, you do have a battle. The fact is, if there is no estate planning and mom or dad had five or six children, yes, the property's going to have to go in all of their names. Okay. Period. Now, as far as, I don't know if you can who's gonna, this question. Who, who's going to pay for it? No. It's, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It's, you. It's just like you said, They'll still let us pay that mortgage. Oh, yes, you, you, you have to continue to pay the mortgage. There, there are some people out here advising folks not to pay the mortgage once mm -hmm. someone uh, goes to heaven. Yeah. I, I, please, I mean, please, no. please yeah. keep the mortgage current. Mm -hmm. Because here's what happens if it goes into foreclosure. If you miss three or four months of payment, mm -hmm. Because the families are feuding, you don't want to pay the mortgage because you have the job and they're living in it and you just don't want to do it, and then you wait four months and you decide to do it. Once that foreclosure is filed, then the mortgage company wants the whole balance due. Mm -hmm. They're not going to allow you to redeem the four months and start paying it. Once that foreclosure is filed, whatever is old, if you want to redeem it, you're going to have to pay that whole amount, and that becomes burdensome. Because so. I keep having people telling me different things. I know. And it's like, then even if you want to do this income tax thing, where you have to, somebody has to file it. Well, that's your so, least of your concerns, okay, is who's going to file for the taxes. Just, your number one priority is to is to pay the mortgage. Okay. Now, here's some good news about that. You can actually stay in the home forever, mm -hmm. and it still be in mom's name or dad's name, mm -hmm. as long as you pay that mortgage. Right. But you're never going to be able to sell it. You won't be able to refinance. Right. You won't be able to do a number of things until you go through the probate process. Okay. But in some families' cases, it is, it's not even worth it. If you have six 
siblings, mm -hmm. and you're the only one that's working, if you're going to pay all the costs, the property's going to go in all of your names, you might as well just pay the mortgage, live in it, and not spend your money to go through the probate process and live in it forever, and then let them deal with it once you go to heaven. I mean, they give it bits and pieces, but it's like... But even at that, it's still going all of yeah. your names, and then it's going to require all of your signatures and okay. consent to sell it, to transfer it, whatever it may be. And here's what I've discovered, folks. If you have at least three kids, one of them's a problem. <laughs> that's, that's the rule of thumb. Okay, if you got three, you got one's a problem. And if you, there's six in your family, that means you got at least two problems you got to do with. Well, I got one right now. Got she it. just knows the back. <laughs> yes, well, so that is, that is the reason why um, it is so important to do some of the things that we're talking about today. Yeah, just okay. I have a question, I'm sorry. So my plan is not to leave anything to my children. I'm not trying to be harsh, but I want them to get their own. That's the Bill Gates school of thought, yes. <laughs> but I want to leave it to my grandchildren. So if I put that in the will, are they still in a, a position to contest it, or my will stands? Well, I, I'm going to take that question as well. So that's, I'm glad you brought that up because the reality is rule number one for if, so when you talk about wills, you're talking about estate planning. Right. And the reality is rule number one for efficient estate planning is no wills. No wills. Because if you have a will, then your loved ones are going to have to go through the expensive, stressful, time-consuming probate process. So there are other ways to leave your home to your loved ones, children, all of them, or just the good one, or none of them, and the grandchildren. There are ways to leave it to them without them having to go through the expensive probate process. Or toady, a land trust, living trust, there are other vehicles, but no wills. If you don't get anything out of this from Attorney Ted London, you don't want wills because if you have a will, that's going to send your loved ones through the expensive probate process. Most people wrongfully believe that if one has a will that keeps their things out of probate court when in fact it's exactly the opposite. Mm -hmm. So believe it or not, we don't we haven't done a will in my office in the last twenty plus years. Dang. Because it sends your loved ones through the probate process and that's what we want to help them try to avoid. It really simply the, the di only difference between having a will and not having a will is a will um, you create your estate plan and they have to follow what you put in the will. If you don't have a will the state makes your estate plan, and you follow what the state put in state law. You still have to go through the same probate process. So, Or if you do some estate plan, and you can avoid all of that, and whomever you name gets your assets directly once you go to heaven, and they can avoid all the stress of and expense. Right, because I don't want the city to do a damn thing for me. Yes, <laughs> yeah. Uh, they, the, it won't be the city. It's going to be the, the state. It's not going to be the state. You know what it's going to be? It's going to be the lawyers. It's going to be the lawyers who are going to be billing your families. Exactly. Okay? And let me tell you something about lawyers, too. I know we got some in here, so I'll just speak, I'll just speak for myself. Uh, when your families come in, nine times out of ten, they're already fighting. Mm -hmm. yeah. That means more, more billing for me. And even if they don't come in fighting, I know how to get them started. <laughs> so they're going to be fighting by the time they leave. I love it. I'm just telling you the truth. Yes. They're going to be fighting by the time they leave. Yes. Do you mind if I add something to that? Yeah, you please do. The free lawyers at Legal Aid Chicago okay. don't do probate. So you cannot get a free lawyer who is going to deal with the fighting. So if there is a family doing fighting, you're going to have to be paying the lawyer. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I'm going to start a fight. I know how to do it. So there you go. And oftentimes they come in fighting, and your children are fighting about things that occur that happen when they were 9 and 10 and 13 years old. They're coming, not adult things. These are children, childhood things that occur uh Oftentimes, mama loans you money, you never paid it back. No, now you you shouldn't get a profit, just whatever it may be. And I just sit there and listen, I'm on the clock. <laughs> and it's okay, fight on. I'm just being honest. But, 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 you can avoid it all. You can avoid it all. And that's why we're here to tell you and share with you how to avoid it. If you don't, you, you're going to listen. And I'm one of the good guys. If you end up one of the other $450 an hour, lawyers, then they're going to be living on Van Buren Street somewhere and Jackson Street somewhere and watching the parkway somewhere. And so uh, we're just here to share with you. That's why we're here. Before we get to our next question, I know this gentleman had his hand up and I just want to give him well, a minute. I just want to say about a year ago, I came into your office, Arnold Beard. Yes, sir. And you really helped me tremendously. Thank you. Doing an estate plan. Yes, sir. Like you're doing at this point. Yes, sir. So 
to know the do's and don'ts. Yes, sir. And I just want to thank you. Thank you, sir. You relieved a lot of stress that I would have had yes, sir. had I not done it. We're grateful. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. But you've always heard, will, 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 will. That is true. That is true. Yeah, and, and that's shocking. It, it, it was always shocking to everyone. But when I go make presentations, that's one of the, if you, because you hear a lot of information, but that's one of the one things I want you to get into your minds and share that with your friends. No wills, because a will is going to send it through the pro, it's $500 filing fees or so. Uh, you have to get a bond. You got to pay this dang old lawyer. They ain't cheap. And the mortgage. And you got to still pay the mortgage. You got to deal with all the siblings, even the one, you know, that's a headache one. And, and, and then it becomes a real mess. And then what happens is people get frustrated. And then they say, listen, I'm out. And so the good kid checks out. And then now you just got with the, with the, with the weed smoking peeps and the, and the drinking peeps. And then, and then within you know, your house been in family for 20, 20, 25 years. And in a matter of 18 months, the house is lost. We see that every day. And let me tell you something about your homes, too. Your homes, your homes, many of you are what they call equity rich. Yes. Many of you are what they call equity rich. Do you, do you all know what that is? Uh -huh. that, well, some, some of you who may not, so let me tell you what you are and how you are equity rich. That means you owe more than half of, no, you have more than half of equity in the home. That means your home is worth $150,000 if you owe only $75,000, that means you have 50% equity in the home, that means they call you equity rich. And your properties are skyrocketing. Yes, they are. In value. Mm -hmm. And everyone's talking about leaving, um, I hear this so much, everyone's talking about leaving generational wealth. I, if I hear that one more time, I'm just going to scream. General rich. Well, the fact is you are leaving generational wealth to your children and grandchildren. When you leave them, you're paid up or close to pay for homes. But well, you have to do it in an efficient way so they don't have to come to my office on the, on the probate side. Because you know what I'm doing? I'm telling you now, I'm going to have them fighting. I'm going to overcharge them. You're going to have some other fees, and that's what it's going to be. As opposed to avoiding it while you're living. And like the gentleman said, he's relieved. He, it's going to be efficient for his loved ones. He's in 100% control of everything. And, and you can do the same thing if you do it. No, when you do it. When you do it. No, yes. yes. Just piggybacking on something you said, especially about the wills. And that's why the, the state legislature passed the Transfer on Death Instrument Act. That's why we're talking about the toadies. Because the government knows that most people's biggest asset is their home. And if you could transfer that property without having to go through the expensive probate process, you would save a lot of stress, time, and money for your loved ones after you pass. So that's really what we're trying to do here is provide you with the information on how you could do that today. So, um, there's another question here I'd like to, to, to ask, and, I, it, and if it's not correct, let me know. But it says, should everyone still have a trust? Is that the correct question that someone asked? I have a card here. It was on the same card that said, will a mortgage company acknowledge a token? Oh, that's me. I'm yeah. sorry. So, yeah. was that your question? It, should it, everyone? It, it kind of got answered in the conversation. Okay. So okay, great. Good. Okay. The next question I have... How do you get your house back from property fraud? So I can answer this question. Our office has a property fraud unit in our office. And it, that unit was put into place to deal with issues of property fraud. Historically, if someone committed fraud on your property, you had to hire an attorney. You had to go in the court and file a quiet title action. And it's expensive. It's time consuming. And, you know, in many cases, you know, the person who actually committed the fraud has already done what they need, wanted to do with the property and, and they did left with money or whatever. Um, our office, and that's why we have the Property Fraud Alert Program, um, can actually go into uh, court with the administrative law judge and file a complaint on be your behalf. We, the, the state's attorney represents our office and basically nullify the document, invalidate the document that was filed that was fraudulent. You know, we haul the person into court and say, hey, that you file this document with the clerk's office. It's, we, we're saying it's false. Prove that it's not. If you can't, we're going to have a judge issue an order saying that document's null and void, disregarding the chain of title. It's very important that you contact our office as soon as you discover any kind of fraud so that our, 
our investigators and our attorneys could get to working on the case and putting it before the administrative law judge. And that's why the uh, property fraud alert is so important. Because the way it works is if there's any document recorded on your property, and it's done by your PIN number, the same number that's on your property tax bill. Um, if there's anything recorded on that property, you'll get a phone call or an email or a text that says, hey, just so you know, someone recorded something on your property. You might want to check that out. If you just refinanced your, your, prop, your mortgage, that, that's probably what it is. And, and you can check it out. Okay, I know what that is. But if you didn't do anything and you get a fraud alert, chances are someone uh, recorded something improperly or there was even an error. Um, it was put on the wrong property. So we have a process uh, within our office. It doesn't mean you can't hire an attorney to pursue your own interests, but we'd be happy to take that on on your behalf. So uh, you can get that fraudulent document removed from, from your chain of title and be put back in the position you were in before they committed the fraud. Does that answer that question? Okay, follow up question? What if, like the lady in the South South, that she can't get the woman out of the house, the woman moved in and changed the locks. So I'm outdoors and she's in my house, right? So yeah. how do you do the same thing to get my house back? We would do it to get your house back on paper. Unfortunately, you'd have to evict that person. Um, Ms. Long, yeah, yeah, yeah so that's right. So you, you can't do a self-remedy sort of eviction. You can't put someone out. I, I would be curious to know how they got in the home, but in any event, if someone's in your home for more than a statutory amount of time, three days, five days, 10 days, whatever it may be, yes, you have to actually evict them. And so these days, eviction is kind of a long, arduous process. It is a pricey process. It's very difficult for people to do it on their own. So in many of these cases, I suggest that you hire lawyers because if you do these things wrong, you can go a long way down the road and the judge will kick it back and then you have to start from the very beginning. So in your case, if someone's in the home it, and, and they aren't paying rent or they shouldn't be there, yes, you're gonna have to, you have to do a, what's called a forceful detainer action to get them out. I don't have that problem. I just saw it on the news. Oh, sure. <laughs> <laughs> you know, well, the, well, well there is a, that is occurring all over the country. I know it's occurring a lot in Florida and a lot in California uh, where people are moving in homes. And, yes, the, the, they do have to go through the, the, the Yeah, they, they have to go through the legal process of evicting them. That is so. So the ones who file paperwork to steal your home. Oftentimes, they don't live in the home. They just steal your home to refinance it. And pull the money out, and then and then don't pay the mortgage. So they're not they're not doing that to live in it. They're doing it to to extract the money. Yeah. Uh, it looks like a follow up question. How do you get your home back for delinquent taxes? You just answered it. Okay. <laughs> and then it's one on the back. A uh, one on the back. Who can help seniors pay property taxes? So. There are programs offered by the county, such as the Senior Freeze Exemption, uh, Senior Citizen Exemption, uh, which would lower your property tax amount. In many cases, the Senior Freeze is not only based on the age of, of the individual, but also their income level. So if you're on a fixed income and, have, and meet the certain threshold and you're a senior, that could dramatically reduce your property tax liability. So. Um, I would suggest reaching out to the Cook County Assessor's Office, making sure that you have all of the exemptions that you're entitled to on the property, and that could dramatically reduce uh, your tax liability for your property taxes. Okay, uh, next question. Can I fill out a toady after the death of my spouse whose name is still on the deed. And I'm guessing, I'm guessing the person who asked that is also on the deed, listed on the deed. So you and your spouse are listed on the property, and unfortunately your, your spouse has passed away. Can you still do a toady? That is the question. So here's a question. Again, we kind of touched on this point uh, a little earlier. And you, and you people, you have to be mindful of how your deed is set up especially if your name is on the deed with even a spouse. Because we've seen instances in my office where a husband and wife, their names are on the deed in tenancy in common. Because if the appropriate language is not on the deed, if one of them passes away, their half has to be probated. Okay, so if, if that deed isn't prepared properly, 
And do we see this sometimes when when uh, a couple may own a home together and one of them takes their name off of the home to refinance it? And then they'll they'll prepare a deed themselves to put both their names back on the home, but they don't list it as joint tenancy or tenancy by entirety. So that makes it tenancy in common. And so what happens is, especially for those who are in second marriages or relationships, and we've seen this often, uh, husband and wife, uh, one of them passes away. Let's say I'm, if I'm thinking in my mind now. Um, the wife passed away, the property was only in her name, even though she had been married to her husband for 20 years. Mm -hmm. And his name was on the mortgage, took it off to refinance, and didn't put his name back on the mortgage. Mm -hmm. And so when she passed away, unexpectedly, 56 years old, um, she had three children. Uh -huh. And although he had paid the mortgage for the last 20 years, he had to go through the probate process to get, he was entitled to half, her three children were entitled to the other half, and he had to actually buy them out to get his home back. So he spent, a, uh, he spent a lot of money to have to do that. He wasn't happy, and we've seen that with, with, uh, with, with husbands passing away, and, and they had to, the wife had to buy the husband's kids out. We've seen it the other way. So you have to make sure those deeds are prepared correctly. You can go to the Record of Deeds website and pull a copy of your deed, and just see, is, is it, do you own this property in joint tenancy and tenancy in common? Um, and then you should consult with a lawyer to make sure it is done properly because it, it, if it is not, you're going to have to go through the probate to probate just that half, just that half of, of the, the, the home. So in your case, first of all, to see if you could do a chody, her question was, can she do a chody once her husband passes away? If, if the deed was in joint tenancy, once husband passed away, you own the entirety of it, and yes, you can do a chody. If uh, if um, if it was in tenancy in common, and you only have half of it, and your husband's half must be probated, I believe you can do a chody for just your half. And so you can do a chody for half or whole, depending on how the deed is set up. So that's important to know. And, and, and Attorney London refers to the Recorder Deeds Office. I just want everyone to be aware that since 2020, the Recorder Deeds Office of Cook County combined with the Cook County Clerk's Office. So our office is the office you would come down to to record all of those important documents. Mm -hmm. It's still in the same spot that it used to be in, if you're familiar with the county building, mm -hmm. uh, 118 on the first floor room. Um, what is it? Room 120. Yeah. Wow. So, um, yeah, just wanted to make sure you guys understood that you can come to our office at, at the Cook County Clerk's Office. We're the ones that handle recording all of your important documents. You know, before we go to the next question, may I ask a question and answer it? Yes. Uh, uh, just because I want to, uh, uh, I know this is not the proper venue for this, but I'd like to give you some information about Medicaid and about Medicaid spend downs. So I know we get a lot of clients concerned about Medicaid. If they want your nurse home, what's going to happen to their homes? Can Medicaid take the home? And so you have to be mindful about what's called a Medicaid spend down. If someone goes into a nursing home and they can't pay for the care themselves, Medicaid can take your home and then to pay for your care before they start paying for your care. That's called a Medicaid spend down. They can take your financial assets, check and save and mutual funds, life insurance, to, to pay for your care before, before they, Medicaid, start paying for your care. If you're married and one of the spouses goes into a nursing home, Medicaid will not take the home. And so if you're married, Medicaid will not take your home uh, if one of the spouses goes into a nursing home. And they will allow you to keep up to $160,000. If you're single, if you go into a nursing home, if you can't pay the $6,500 to $7,500 per month cost, Medicaid is going to get your home, and they're going to sell it or put a lien on it. They're going to they're gonna withdraw all the funds from your account via a court order to pay for your care before you start before Medicaid starts paying for it. So some of you should be consulting with lawyers about protection against Medicaid spend downs as well, okay? Because that's very prevalent as people age because research suggests that over half of all people 65 years old and older will spend some time in a nursing home. And as we age, the rate, uh, the possibility of us and the percentage of those aging going to a nursing home is even higher. And people are living longer and so that means the, the likelihood that some folks 
in their 70s, 80s, 85s or older will be spending some time in, in nursing homes. So you want to protect your assets from a Medicaid spend down. I have a question on that. What if uh, your home is, uh, you know, your children's name is on that home? Can Medicaid still take it? <coughs> so you said children's name on the home, that makes me want to sit this thing down my throat and gag. <laughs> I would never, ever, ever put my client's children's names on their homes. I would never transfer my home out of my name into my children's. No, I don't mean like that. I'm saying like what we're doing here today. Well, uh, if you put it in a toady to okay. name your children, mm -hmm. I would. I, there's two questions. I'm going to answer them both. If you put your home in a toady to leave your home to your children once a person passes away, that would not protect the home against what's called a Medicaid spend down. Okay. okay, now back to the other issue, because some people think this is a good idea to put the children's names on the home, or even to take the home out of their name and put it in the children's names. Absolutely not, never, ever, ever. Would never, ever do it. And we do get some clients that come in, they want to add their children's names to the homes. And so if you do that, if the child is ever sued, they can put the lien on your home. I've seen a case where uh, a mother had put her only daughter's name on the two-flat building over in uh, um, um, the Beverly area, $400,000 building, building was paid for, mom had paid it, she thought it was her only daughter, I want to make sure she gets if something happens to me, I did not do this. Well, at the time, mother and daughter lived in the building together, daughter wasn't married, daughter got married to a fella. And mother wanted daughter to take her name off of the building so she could refinance it to get a lower interest rate. And she was going to pull some money out of the building. The building was paid for. She was going to pull some money out because the interest rates were so low. And the daughter's new husband told her, don't sign your interest over to that building until you get half the value of the property. Wow. And mom actually gave her $175,000 to get her building back. Now, of course, they don't speak anymore. Oh and so I would never put, it, professionally I would never do it, okay? Uh, I would never put your kids' names on your properties or I would never, never take your name off of it and, and give it to them. Right. We want to make sure they get it very easily once once they love ones right. goes, goes to heaven. Now, I was asking a question to see if Medicare could still take it if someone else's name is on the property. Yes. Of the mm -hmm. Are they still with you? Yes. Okay. Unless, it's a unless, it, unless it's a spouse. Great, yeah. Okay. Unless it's a spouse, yes. Okay, very uh, helpful information today. Um, the next, there's another question, and it, I think this is some background. It says, I am paying Chicago title and trust to house my deed that is supposed to be in trust. How do I get my name off my building and back in trust? Are those two separate questions? Well, it sounds to me like someone had a property in a land trust, which is a good thing, and they may have taken it out of trust to refinance it. So if you have your property in a trust, and if you're going to refinance it or something like that, you're going to take it out of the trust and put it back in your name personally. Once you close on the refi, you have to put it back into the trust. So if any of you have that issue, you can call my office. We'll help you do that. Okay, but it needs to go back into the trust. Your trust probably remains open, uh, uh, with the presumption that you're going to refi and, and then put it back in the trust. So you can go back in that same trust, with the same trust number. You can update your contingent beneficiaries. That's who's going to get it after you if you want to. And that's very straightforward. But you do have to get that property back in the trust. Otherwise, if, if whoever wrote that question, if you go to heaven, it's going to have to do what? Go through the what? Probate. Probate. That's right. Did that answer your question? Okay. Follow up? Good question. It wasn't refinanced. What it was, it, it was uh, when you went down to the city hall. Somehow, um, the person got confused as to um, whose name it should be in, and they probably and what they did, it, they put it in some, put it back in their name, and put it in their name instead of leaving it in trust. In other words, city hall does not care whose name is on the on the um, deal. <laughs> What, on, on what bill are we referring to? The, the, your taxes. Yeah, see, that, has, that has no relevance to, to the ownership of the property. That's another misconception that if your name is on the bill, you have an interest in the property. We, we get that a lot uh, for, for, for some of our clients who have property in the South. They think that just because they're paying the taxes, that 40 acres, they're entitled to it. That is not true. It's still going to be, it's still going to go to all of the heirs. You're just the good kid, like the lady in the yellow, who's, who's paying the expenses. But that doesn't give you any additional interest in the property. 
And so, but the bottom line is, if there was a trust, if the property was taken out of the trust, and now the property is in someone's name personally, yes, you can put that property back in the trust if the trust hasn't been closed. Even if it is closed, you should put it in a new trust because having it in a land trust is a good thing. Okay. Yes. Okay. Um, next question. Is the property after death uh, for Chicago residents only, or what about suburban restaurants? Uh, residents, not restaurants. And the answer is yes, it applies to suburban residents just the same as it would city residents. The law applies to actually everyone in the state of Illinois, but in order to effectuate this, you have to go to your local county uh, recorder or clerk's office, whoever is responsible for recording the transfer and death instruments. And um, so whether you live in a city or you live in suburban Cook County, you would come and record those transfer and death instruments with our office at uh, the Cook County Clerk's Office. That's, that's the one downtown? 118 North Clark, room one. Even if you live in a suburb? Yes. Okay. Unfortunately, we don't have any suburban satellite offices that handle recordings anymore. Okay. So, I have three daughters that live in the suburbs, and they definitely need this. So, can I take applications for them to sure. come out and make it up? Sure. I, we have the forms. We can give you some extra forms before you leave, and you can bring them to your to your family members. I will get. I will give you flyers. You know what? I, I'm going to advise all of you to uh, to seek legal counsel when you're preparing these documents. You, you have a legal service here for free. I am not a free lawyer, as you can tell. <laughs> no, I am not. But you can always call the office and we'll give you free information. Okay? But, but some of you need to pay for your expenses and, and your service, and some you can afford to. But some may not be. And you have a service here that's going to, that's going to help you. I would, not be doing these, I would not be doing these things on my own, even though you can. I would not be. I would. I would be seeking a service that's for free, or come see me, and I'm gonna bill you. It's reasonable. You can afford it, but seek seek legal counsel when you're doing these things. You want to make sure it's done correctly. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Where's the ball ring? Oh, I don't discuss fees when I go out. I, no, no, no. We're not discussing fees. We're just here for information. Yes. Thank you, sir. He's a, he's a former client, or he is a client. Yes. You came in late, and so. I have a question. Yes, sir. This goes to you, Ms. Money, and to the clerk. Earlier, I was cited for a violation of property. You know, I brought it to you. Mm -hmm. Have you all encountered situations where they had me listed on some some other property, which I, was, I knew I didn't own it and all that, and, and I in the land trust for them to find out who owns it, they charge you $100. And so... I don't know if there's some you can bring to the land trust attention or the clerk or you, Mr. Ryan's No, we're, 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 I, I'm not sure if I quite understand that issue. They cited me for, for the city, the city, the, the, the city, got it. I had to go to court. Okay. But in doing so, which they had one property right, the other one was wrong. So I had to present and, and pretty much tell them I did not own that property was a, a additional property. I know nothing about it. And you know, so but and having a land trust to the Yes, yeah, Chicago title, title land trust. They charge you a hundred dollar fee. Got it. Oh I wish I wish you would have called my office. I did. Oh I, got I, it. I talked to it, but I held it but yeah. I just wanted to bring it to you all's attention that that happens or may have been happening and maybe you all could Address it. I will. I will address that with Chicago Tower Land Trust. I won the case. Goes, yes. You know, a little mistake, but nonetheless, they charge you a hundred dollars for having it in the land. Sure. Trust sure. With title and law. Got it. Got it. Okay. I'll, I'll. I'll. I'll talk to them about that. And I can talk to you. Another yes, time indeed. You yes, back. indeed. Okay. Um, the next question I have here: How can we stop? A balloon payment on our home. Okay. And I think that's that's the entirety of the question. 
I would take that one. <laughs> 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 they told you quick. <laughs> <laughs> oh. So the question is about a reverse, uh, uh, about a balloon mortgage. I haven't seen balloon mortgages in quite some time. That was very popular some years ago. Um, um, to get out of a balloon mortgage, you have to refinance the property. And, and frankly, frankly, you have waited a long time because a year or so ago, interest rates were at two and a half, three percent. And so you've kind of missed the opportunity to get the super low rate. But the fact is, rates are just under six percent now. Historically, those are still competitive rates. So if you want to get out of a balloon mortgage, you have to refinance the property and get a traditional 15 to 30 year mortgage. Or just pay off some of you. Some of you can pay off lump sum balances. <laughs> I can I can spot you too. So some of you can just write a check and pay it off, and that will that will take care of that uh, that that um, balloon mortgage for you. Okay. Thank you. And I think you might want your card back because it has some of your notes on there. So Brian, I don't know if you want to. Okay. I have a card here. I think it says bank account, no beneficiaries. Is that is that right? Yeah. Um, my just... mother died about four years ago, and she left a bank account and uh, went to the bank. Showed the death certificate and uh, the will. They won't release the money. So, so here's what happened. Listen, here's the bottom line. When someone passes away, there are really only two issues. It's the real estate and the money. No one's fighting over your 30-year-old fur coat. <laughs> you, the fox stole with the face still on it, okay? Like my, like my grandmother used to have. Then nobody's fighting over that. They're fighting over the real estate and they're fighting over the money. And so those are two primary things that you want to make sure that you keep out of probate court along with yourselves with the power of attorneys. But when it comes to the money, if there are no beneficiaries on the accounts, who's going to get the money? All the children will get the money. They're all going to be entitled to it. So the issue is how do you get the money? Well, if it's over $100,000, you're going to have to go through the probate process, Whoa. period. If it's under $100,000, you can use what's called a small estate affidavit to collect the money. But in any event, not just the good kid, not just the kid who's going to the bank is going to get the money. It's going to be all of them. So, when so, you say $100,000, yes. can there be more than one bank account? Well, well technically, to, that's, that's a good question. Under. That's a good question. So the, your question, I'll help you frame it. The question is, if it's more than $100,000 in multiple accounts, do you have to go through the probate process? Uh, technically, the answer is yes. You have to go through the probate process if it's more than $100,000 collectively in all of your accounts, yes. Again, that's another thing. You have to make sure that you have beneficiaries on all of your accounts. And you have to make sure that your loved ones have beneficiaries on all of their accounts. Because if you don't, then who are you going to have to come and see? Me. You. <laughs> and, and they're not going to be able to help you. And so now you have a new brother. Hello, family. <laughs> all because you didn't do what? Add beneficiaries onto your accounts. So if you, get, if you don't do that, and we tell you to do that, it's free to do. You just go and you take the time and do it. And so. Most bank accounts have a form that's a terminable on death form. You just go out and you fill it out and list who you would want to get the money in your account if you pass away. Can you say that again? What's, what's, what's the name of the form again? A terminable on death. It's a TOD. They, Account. And that applies to checking, saving, and mutual funds, 401ks, stocks, bonds, CDs, credit unions, life insurance policies, annuities, even hidden accounts that you that you people have. Any kind of financial accounts that you have to apply. have current beneficiaries on them. I say current because we are finding that people have beneficiaries on their accounts that they aren't married to any longer. We had one case where a lady was married to her husband. For eight years, he passed away at 49, worked for UPS, unexpectedly at work, had a half million dollar life insurance policy, never took the first wife's name off of it as a beneficiary. Oh, wow. First wife got a half million dollars lump sum tax free. Oh, 
Okay, uh, I can imagine her saying, I deserve it anyway. So, so that was God. That they said that was Jesus calling. That was Jesus calling. Okay, and and, um, and we have people who have people who are who have passed away before them as beneficiaries. We have people that as beneficiaries that people don't even like anymore. And so you have to make sure that periodically you are updating these, and not just for yourselves. But you have to make sure your loved ones are doing it too, because if they're going to leave you some money, you want to make sure that you're going to be able to get it effortlessly without having to come and see Ted Lugman guy, or even worse, some other person. Right. I'm a good guy, so right. you go to a bad guy, and then sorry to hear it. Yeah. Okay. The next question, if the and I think this goes to you know, kind of the heart of what we're talking about today. If the property goes to heirs after death, number one, how is it that heirs get the property if it's still in the deceased's name? Well, there's one of them, and, and you can well, answer it. Well, again, so again, there's only, there's only one of a number of ways. Either you're going to go through the probate process after they have passed away and they didn't have any estate planning, or you had some estate planning. Is this one of the two? Either you have some estate planning, totally, land trust, living trust, or, or you don't have any. There's no in between. Either you're prepared or you're not. Okay, and we're here to share with you how to prepare in an efficient way. That's the, the, the reasonable. We have someone that can do it for free. How, how much you, you get for free? Okay. okay, we're giving you great information. Some of you will need to pay. Some of you can afford to pay. But you know, so you have it free and paid. What? What more? <laughs> this is it. This is this is it for you. You have to get it done because I'm telling you, if you don't, it's going to go through the probate process, and then you're going to, it's going to be it's going to be uh, pricey to 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 get it accomplished, and even worse, you're going to have to deal with some of your brothers and sisters. No. Yes, sir. I just have a question. Uh, I, I I missed the question, but you have this is the wheel, and then there's another wheel that prohibits that you don't have to go through probate. So all wheels you don't have to go through probate. Yes, sir. If you you did you missed that. Yes, okay. any kind, the, the, there's only one kind of will. He showed up on a wheel. Yeah, there's only one kind of will, and yes, and we, you missed it. But uh, but if there is a will, even most people don't even have wills. Even the people who think that a will will keep their things out of probate court, they don't even have any. The reality is, only about a third of all Black folks have any estate planning at all. And we're talking about smart, accomplished, successful people who acquired real estate, have savings, and and you would think that they would know better. Don't. Okay, and so, but the reality is sometimes they just have misinformation because, you know, we get so many people talking to us and telling us, and yeah. not one of them went to a, a day of law school, and they're advising us. And so I'm just, I'm just, I'm just giving you straight, plain information. So, yes, if there is a will, yes, it has to go through the expensive probate process. We don't do wills for our clients. There are other estate planning tools, a toady, land trust, living trust to keep your real estate out of probate. Well, that's a single family home, multi-unit, whether it's paid for or not, you have to have some, some estate planning in order. Okay, question really quickly. Mm -hmm, it was my card. Oh, okay. Um, I just wasn't clear. So what's confusing me is um, when someone dies and, and, and uh, they don't have a toady and it goes to their heir, what do you mean by, where does it go? Like, because if you haven't gone to probate, it's still in the deceased person's name. But when you say it goes to their heir, well, you have to. What does the goals mean? Well, like, it means you have to perfect your interest in the property. And so, let's say, for example, a person passed away with three kids, where are, they are the heirs. They're going to be entitled to the property, so it goes to them. But you have to perfect your interest by going through the probate process to get it from mom or dad's name deceased to the name of the heirs, their children. So it has to, it's going to go to the children, but you have to perfect your interest in acquiring the property by going through the, the probate process. Okay. And then I'm just going to read the, the second part on there. Okay. So if that house is still in the deceased person's name, and it catches on fire, you have to file a, a, a claim with the homeowner's insurance, but the deed is still in the deceased person's name, but the heir is still living. Mm -hmm. How does that work? So then the insurance company will pay the claim, and so someone's going to have to go through the probate process to be appointed the administrator of the estate, and then they're going to be able to negotiate that claim. 
Yeah. Everything leads back to probate. And then, and then that leads to who? Me. <laughs> and, and then what do I want? Cash. <laughs> so, so it would be safe to say that if the parent's name is still on the deed, that the insurance company would pay the claim out to the deceased parents, the estate of the, exactly. the deceased parents. Exactly. And so you have, to, you have to then open up an estate and be named the administrator to collect the funds, make the claim, sign the documents, deposit the check, mm -hmm. and then pay the adjuster and the crew to, to do the repairs. Mm -hmm. So it's a process. That's a process. That's a headache process for the lawyer. Mm -hmm. And if you come to me with that issue, I just, I just, hey sis, I, I like, the, I like, the, I like this backsplash instead of that one, because that's what it's going to be by the time it ends up. You have to make sure you get these things managed. Now, again, sometimes we just wait too late and too long. We don't do it, and then our family members don't, and and then you you don't have any other option. But for those of you who are here, you're listening, share this information with your friends and your family. You really can't get it any better than this. Free. 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 You know, and, and some of you, some of you don't need free. And so, and so either way, you, you, how can, you're winning. But just please just get it done. Question for you. I, I, I remember the part where you said never, never put the kid's name. So this thing here, what we're going to do, this thing right here, my brother said we'll do. Because we already picked for just one of us mm -hmm. to beyond it. And this is the best thing to do. Well, that's one of the things that you can do. That it depends on what people's objectives are. But yes, you can use a toady for mom. Is it mom? It's mom. Yeah, mom to name yeah, the good kids. Yeah. For mom to name the good kid to get the property. Okay. <laughs> good uh, got it, got it. <laughs> <laughs> Whoever sometimes sometimes the parents love to not good ones too, okay? Yeah, and wrong. uh <laughs> and then and so but whoever mom wants to name, yes, a toady will be efficient to get it to get it to brother. Seamlessly, once mom goes to heaven. No, he won't have any problems. No, no problems at all. Yeah, in, you bring up the issue with the children. We say don't put your children on the deed while you're alive, but right. if, by doing a toady, they're technically not on the deed until you pass. Right. Right. So right. someone could be a beneficiary of a toady, but they don't really have an interest until the person who completed the toady actually passes. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, how long from start to finish under the free process and all the steps? I guess it'd be a nice question. Now, I'll, you did mine, it was like within a couple of days. Yes. But you got it made in that regard. But under the free process, how long would it take to all the steps? You sure. So you would contact us and we'd schedule an appointment. So you would come, you would have your appointment. So let's say I called and I made my appointment and Melissa was my attorney. Mm -hmm. I would go in, Melissa would fill out my paperwork. We are free attorneys. There is one cost to the client. You do have to pay at the clerk's office to file that toady. We will fill out the paperwork for you. Having that filled out paperwork means nothing until it is filed in the clerk's office. So I'll have, let's say I have my appointment at 9 o'clock tomorrow morning. I can walk up the street to 118 North Clark Street and file it. Once that is stamped, it's valid. If I walk out and get hit by a car and pass away that afternoon, my my house will be left to Attorney Melody over here. <laughs> I've left you my house. Congratulations. <laughs> here Thank we you. go. All these clients that can pay you, I'm leaving you my house. Take a backsplash that you like. Yes. <laughs> it, it all depends on when your appointment is. So as soon as you get your appointment, it's on you to go file that paperwork. That paperwork is effective the moment it is filed. And then once, once you pass away, if that toady is on file, all that happens, let's say I do leave my house to attorney over here, he just has to go file an acceptance. And then the house is his. So that's it, that's and, the process. It's and just, quick, it's easy. And just so you're aware, the cost of recording a toady is $50. Oh. Before, it used to be much more money but Clerk Yarbrough worked with the Cook County Board of Commissioners, especially when COVID started coming around, to reduce the fee uh, for recording a toady because we knew how important it was mm -hmm. to make sure that people were going to be able to afford to do this. It really is much cheaper than a lot of the other options out there. Okay. What about, what about you, um, quick claim deed? Mm -hmm. the, are you asking about what the price would be for? No, 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 I'm not talking about the price. Okay. If, if I decide to do this, do I have to 
do I still need to do a quick claim deed? Because I've been doing it for the same or are quick, they two different things? They're two different yeah. things. And a quick claim deed is just basically a deed from you to, to somebody saying, whatever my interest is, is now your interest. You're actually giving away your property today, the day you issue a quick claim deed, unless you're quick claiming it to yourself plus somebody else. But um, yeah, a quick claim deed. You have to replace it just to add a name, remove a name, add a name. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, there's different reasons why people would want to do that. I wouldn't say that that's generally done as a part of an estate plan, but... Um, well, actually, a quick claim deed is done as part of an estate plan if you are transferring the property into some, some sort of trust. Oh, and true. so, yes, you would need a quick claim deed to transfer the property from yourself personally into the name of your trust. And so, but what a quick claim deed does is it transfers the property from someone to someone, your interest in it. So, you got to be careful about doing quick claim deeds. And again, I, 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 I'm just going to say this one last time. I know I, I get on your nerves like I get on my wife's nerve by repeating myself. But you have, to, you have choices of lawyers here. You, you have to see lawyers when you're doing these things. It's going to be beneficial to you. If you try to do it yourself, if you don't get it right, it's going to be ineffective when you need it the most. So, yes, ma'am. So tonight, uh, can we talk with the lawyers and make a point? You know, and get the totally done. Well, well, you can t there if you're going to work with the if you're going to work with the with with the with the um, legal aid clinic. I'm sure they can help you. Right. I'm going to give everyone a little flyer here. You can call my office. My assistant will set up a time for you to come in if you have questions or if you need us to do anything for you. But the important thing, whether you come to my office, their office, you may have your own lawyer's office. Just please get it done. It's it's and not just for you, but for your loved ones and your friends and your neighbors and your loved ones because they need the information as well. So please circulate the information. And we will give you. We have all this information up here. Please come grab it. It has our phone number on it. We don't have access to our scheduling system right here. We just have access to our flyers. But please take the information and call as soon as you have the time to call. Make an appointment, and we'll get you in as soon as we can. One more question, and you can leave it with someone with a blue shirt from our staff. One more question? Yeah, I just want to ask, when will you hold this session again? That's a great we're, question. We're Change. having a forum next Thursday, September 22nd, in um, Lyons Township in Countryside. And it is from 5.30 to 7.30 p.m., and it is in person only. I have flyers on the back table. Okay. It will not be um, on Zoom, and it will not be hybrid. Lindsay, would you like to tell the crowd about um, how they can request having another program brought to their community? Yep, I'm going to go through all of that. Okay. So the first thing I'm going to go over is the property fraud alert form that if you have it completed now, you do not have to have your pin. You're free to go to the back, and um, Mr. Cross or Ms. Johnson will take those from you. You do not need to show an ID unless you are the child of that property or the son or daughter of that property and you'll explain that to them. We do check the addresses and your ID. So you can turn those in in the back and we'll feel free to turn them in, in for you. It takes about two to three weeks for us to document them all. No news is good news. You're only going to get alerts when something is going on with your property. And as uh, the attorneys already told you, if you know that you're processing something with your property like changing your mortgage company or something like that, you want to keep all of that in mind. That's the first thing. The next thing we'd like to thank um, State Rep. LaShawn Ford and Dr. Yeah. Stephanie Rose Baldy for hosting us this evening. It was really, really great. We also have some other very important people from the Austin community to thank. I mean, our very own Ms. Johnson and C.B. Johnson. C.B. Johnson. The two of them did a lot to get um, our program where we needed. They did a final push. And last but not least, but last, but not least out of that group from also the Austin community will be Arnold Bearden. Thank you so much for your push and for all you've done. He's an activist and Black Club president for the Austin community. Thank you for everything you did for our forum tonight. We appreciate it. And of course, we want to thank our attorneys. Thank you for having, having all the questions and helping us. And thank you to Legal Aid, um, Ms. Barbara and Melissa, they were wonderful. Thank you for all the questions and 
giving the free information that our communities need so badly. Thank you so much. And uh, last but not least, thank you to Cook County Clerk staff. Thank you all for helping us out. Uh, if you want to schedule a property after death property fraud form, what you will do is you will contact the special assistant to the clerk for community affairs, who is my supervisor, Ms. Robin Staggers. I have her number, so if you want to write it down, I will give it to you. It is 312-603-3974. Once again, that's 312-603-3974. Once again, her name is Robin Staggers, S T A G G E R S. Could you write the number Yes, 312-603-3974. Special assistant to the clerk for community affairs. Thank you all for coming and attending and being great guests. We hope you all learned something and you all enjoyed it. Have a good evening and be safe.